Thank you. Now I'd like to ask all of us to find the Acts of the Apostles. That's the big book right after the book of John in the New Testament. We are thankful that we were here for the Ohio Revival Conference. These sessions were important. And this conference was important. The conference was important for us and our lives. The conference was important for our churches. The conference was important for our families. The conference was important for some individuals that God had come here to settle things in our mind, both about the Christian life and about what God's doing in the world and about our own life. I was remembering today the National Conference on Prayer and Revival that we held at Finney Chapel back in 1992, long time ago, that's 25 years ago, over there in Oberlin. Today I was thinking about a young man in our church who came forward in one of the services and walked up to me and he said, Pastor Flanders, I'm not sure I'm saved. And with some help in the Bible, he came to assurance of salvation. Before the end of the week, he answered the call to preach. He's been in full-time Christian work and is having a real influence. That happened in a conference like this. A very important time for individual people and for families, for churches, for the cause of Jesus Christ Amen. in Ohio. And for the cause of Jesus Christ around the world. And may I say that you and I sitting here hearing what we've been hearing and having God speak to our heart and being challenged with truths that are often forgotten among God's people is also important for this dark world we live in. Very important. The Acts of the Apostles is the record in the Bible of what the Christians did after Jesus went to heaven. When he went to heaven, he took his seat as the victor at the right hand of the Father and the interceder, inter mediator, interceding for us up there. But the first thing he did when he was there was he sent his people, you and I, the Holy Ghost, to live inside us. Before leaving, he gave us a command to spread the news of his salvation to the uttermost part of the earth. Acts is an exciting book. I was with somebody today who was saying, you know, the Bible is a funny book. People don't think it's funny. And he brought up a few incidents that I think were meant to be humorous in the way they were recorded. But also it's exciting. It's not boring, especially the book of Acts. When you realize what happened when these common people like you and me, full of God, were spread around the world telling this story of our salvation. Now we come to Thessalonica. It's found in Macedonia. Did I tell you where? Chapter 17, Acts chapter 17. They're in Macedonia, that's northern Greece. Paul and his evangelistic team. Now they're coming to another part of Macedonia, having been in Philippi for a while. You know, the Bible, one of the most important things about the Bible is your Bible maps. You know what? Bible is a lot about history, places, events, and it helps us understand this to look at a Bible map and see Macedonia, where some of these towns were, but watch what happened and what was said. Now, when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them, and three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the Scriptures, opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead, and that this Jesus, whom I preach unto you, is Christ. Verse 4. And some of them believed and consorted with Paul and Silas, and of the devout Greeks, a great multitude. And of the chief women, not a few. Verse 5. But the Jews which believed not, moved with envy, took unto them certain lewd fellows of the baser sort, and gathered a company, and set all the city on an uproar, and assaulted the house of Jason, and sought to bring them out to the people. And when they found them not, 
They drew Jason and certain brethren unto the rulers of the city, crying, These that have turned the world upside down are come hither also. Whom Jason hath received, these all do contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, one Jesus. It was said of them that they turned the world upside down, and they did. The culture of the Roman Empire was what we call Western civilization, based on Greek culture and Roman culture. But in one generation, Western civilization was transformed into what we call Christian culture. All of Europe, the United States of America, so much of the world, Western culture certainly is the superior culture of the world. But not in its pagan form, as in the days of the Romans, but in its final form. Christian culture, and it could be said that in the first century, the Christians persuaded the pagan world that Jesus had risen from the dead, which is very significant for every person born in the Western world. And they actually did it. They turned the world upside down. How? Now, you think things are bad now. I've heard people a few years ago, conspiracy theorists, who were worried about the New World Order. Have you noticed that President Bush talks about the New World Order? You know what that is? Illuminati, secret conspiracies. It's an awful thing. Well, I want to tell you something. In Paul's day, they already had the New World Order. The man who ruled the world thought he was God <laughs> yeah, that's right. sitting on the throne. Yeah, I'll tell you what, it was an awful time. Paganism, they mixed sexual impurity with religion. Did you know that? Down at the temple, they had what they called temple prostitutes. See, here's your saying. Uh, you're saying it's never been so bad. Oh, yeah. Even in America, it's been this bad down through history. But you know what they did? They turned the world upside down. How? Politics. Let's run Paul for governor. Is that what they did? Let's unite with others who agree with us on moral issues. You know what? If they had decided to get with others who disagree with them about Jesus Christ, but agree on moral issues, you know, social conservatism, the likely party would be the Pharisees. Can't you see that? Uniting the Christians with the Pharisees, the ones who killed Jesus Christ. No, not politics. How about revolution? You think they had a revolution? Do you think they all rose up against the Roman government with the weapons and uh, decided to defeat the government and take over? Was it protest? No. No. Verse 2 tells us that we're going to learn how they turned the world upside down. It says... And Paul, as his manner was. And there in chapter 17, it reviews to us in very simple terms what Paul did when he went from city to city, traveling around the Roman Empire. And friends, it turned the world upside down. Would you join me in prayer? Thank you, Lord, for these sacred days these important days. Thank you for important things you've been talking to us in the secret place of our heart. Thank you for people you are calling into your work to be separated under the gospel. Thank you for ideas and thoughts you put in our mind. Thank you for changing our mind. Thank you, Lord, for reproving us and helping us to repent. Thank you, Lord, for lifting us up to higher ground. Thank you for the revival we are experiencing. Now, Lord, give us a vision of what we should be doing right now. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, you know what? I want to make a proposal. I think that our world needs to be turned upside down. Amen. Or shall I put it this way? It needs to be turned right side up. Yeah. You know, a lot of us folk who aren't even that old, and I'm not that old, how old do you think I am? No, might as well keep that to yourself. But a lot of people who think uh, that we're older people who say this, not only see the world as immoral and wicked, the world has gone crazy. 
with ideas that prevail now that anybody with common sense can see are backwards. Our world needs to be turned right side up. But this isn't the only time that that has happened. We visited some things having to do with Mr. Finney, who spent his final years in the Cleveland area. He was an evangelist. He went about doing what I'm going to show you right here. And as a byproduct of his evangelistic world work, the culture changed, and not the least of which, the scourge of our nation, our national sin, slavery, was put away from us. And it really was the work of evangelists that changed the minds of the people of this country. But I want to show you really what this was. You see, the Christians of the first century were not trying to change the culture. They were not attempting to change politics. They were trying to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. And as a result, they turned the world upside down. So listen to me carefully. It's important to me that all of us get this and get this into our mind as to what God has us doing. Number one, they used evangelists. Now, would you go back to chapter 16? Look at chapter 16. They're in Macedonia, northern Greece. How did they get there? They were finished their work in what we would call Asia Minor, or Turkey. And the leader, that's Paul, was praying for guidance. You can read about that in chapter 16. But finally, he gets his answer from God. That's verse 9. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. There stood a man of Macedonia and prayed him, saying, Come over into Macedonia and help us. And after he had seen the vision, immediately we endeavored to go into Macedonia, assuredly gathering that the Lord had called us for to preach the gospel unto them. Now watch. They were called to go to Macedonia, which is Europe, to preach the gospel unto them. Now, friends, I'm going to tell you something. This is a very significant verse about what follows. And it's because of the word translated Preach the gospel. Our New Testament, you probably know, Matthew through Revelation, was originally written in Greek. Now, that doesn't uh, make it so we can't understand the New Testament because our King James Bible is an excellent representation of the original Greek. And also, there are people who have studied Greek, like who? I'm not a scholar, but I took four years of Greek in college and seminary. I have a Greek New Testament, Texas Receptus. I can sit down and read Greek. Some people give you the idea that the original was lost somewhere in the past. Oh, no, we've got the Greek. I think all the preachers here tonight do. Now, the word preach in the New Testament, which appears many times, is usually a translation of one of two words. One of the words just means to proclaim. And it'll say preach, it means proclaim. The other one is the word evangelize. A word built on the word evangel, which is gospel. And the kids today in the school chapel knew what the gospel is. The gospel is good news. Now, evangelize. It's really interesting. You can take a strong concordance and check me on this. Evangelize is used once in the book of Matthew. Only once. Every other time it says preach, it's the other word. Never in the book of Mark. All over the book of Luke, like all of a sudden it explodes, and the writer decides to use evangelize instead of proclaim. Never in the book of John. And then it's used in the book of Acts, especially chapter 8. Now, do any of you remember chapter 8? There's an individual man whose life and ministry is featured in chapter 8, and his name would be, I'm testing you, who would that be? That would be Philip. And if you're reading in the Greek language, it says that they went, were scattered everywhere evangelizing the word. And that's the word that was used for it, evangelizing, which means to proclaim the gospel. And Philip evangelized, and then Peter and John came to Samaria, and they evangelized, 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 evangelized. Now, you get the impression that God, the Holy Spirit, is going to show us what it is to evangelize. 
evangelize in the New Testament isn't used like we use it. I saw people handing out tracts in Oberlin today from our group. We call that evangelizing, not the New Testament. Evangelizing was not a one-on-one -on -one thing at all. Evangelizing was the work of an evangelist. And you read all the way chapter 8 of Acts, and Philip is, he was a deacon, but he was evangelizing, evangelizing, evangelizing. Last verse says he was traveling around in the vicinity of Caesarea, and he was an evangelist. Matter of fact, the next time we run into Philip, he's called, help me on this, Philip the... Now, what the New Testament is doing is saying, here's what an evangelist is. Now, Roman people knew what an evangelist was. An evangelist was a proclaimer of good news. Here you are in a village in the Roman Empire. Someone says, come downtown in the city square. They have sent us an evangelist from the front. News from the war. And you know what? It's an evangelist. He is a man who specializes in bringing good news. Now, somebody here will remember, but there's somebody in the Old Testament where people would say, oh, somebody's coming with a message. Look who it is. He's a good man, and he has good news. Remember that vaguely? Okay, that's what an evangelist was. He would show up, and the crowd would gather. He would say, I got news from the front. We won the war. Hooray! Wouldn't you like to be an evangelist? <laughs> His whole job was bringing good news, and he was dispatched when there was good news. So Roman people knew what an evangelist was before there ever was Christianity. That's what the word means. Yeah, Philip was an evangelist. Paul was an evangelist. He was an apostle, yes. That's his special calling and gift. But his work was that of an evangelist. Absolutely he was. He trained others to travel with him. Like Timothy, in his final inspired writing, Paul says to Timothy, do the work of, because Timothy was an evangelist. That's what they were. They were itinerant preachers who would go around and proclaim the good news. That's right. Paul was one. How do I know that? My Greek New Testament, you can check me out in Strong's Concordance, okay? When Paul referred to his work, he called it evangelizing. He said, I am ready to evangelize you that are in Rome also, which to them meant stand up and in a public way proclaim the good news. He says, woe unto me if I evangelize not. Remember that verse? He always referred to his work as that of an evangelist. And he would go about and evangelist always are men who go about and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now we got some weird ideas about evangelists today. I've heard people say, now the guys they call evangelists today, now hold on a minute. Some of you are thinking I'm self-serving about what I'm about to say because they call me an evangelist. What I learned in the Bible about the evangelist, <laughs> I learned when I was a pastor and I actually wrote an article with a date on it, which I can prove was written when I was still a pastor. But here's what uh, an evangelist would do. He would go out and he would publicly proclaim the gospel. Every time God's people have got it right, the evangelist came to the fore. By got it right, what do you mean? Revival. Not the far cry from New Testament Christianity we find in our churches, but the real thing. Full of the Holy Ghost, prayer meetings, spreading the gospel, giving our lives. Every time God's people in general have uh, got it right, the evangelist came to the fore. Remember Ephesians 4? He says God has given gifts to the churches, evangelists, pastors and teachers. Remember that? Evangelist and pastors and teachers go together back to Paul. Some people will say this. No, the evangelists they have today, they're not biblical evangelists. Evangelists in the Bible were church planners. You've got that right. How did they plant churches? Now, here's Paul, comes to Ephesus. He's going to start a church. So what he does is he gets plenty of support from the other churches. He comes and lives in the town. And uh, then you know what he does? He uh, has a Bible study in his home. 
Then after they accumulate about 12 people, then he rents a room in the school. And uh, then, as finally it's getting bigger, he's hoping he can move into a storefront. And after a couple of years, they become a bona fide church, and they have a charter meeting. Everybody signs the charter. That's how Paul planted churches. Right? No. That's not wrong. But a man who plants a church that way is a man who is gifted to be a pastor, not an evangelist. An evangelist comes to a city like Cleveland, and his mindset is, how can we get the gospel to the most people in the shortest period of time? Paul would look for a venue, a way to preach publicly to reach a lot of people who would be receptive. Where did he usually go? Where did Paul start in Corinth and Thessalonica? Where did he start? The synagogue. You know what that was? A venue. Because a Jewish man like him coming to town would be given the right to expound scripture before all the people at the synagogue who were mainly Jews. That's where he got started. What was his vision, though? What's the fastest way we could get the gospel to the most people in this town? Now, a pastor's heart is this. What could be done in this town? And he'll move in. He'll pastor a group of people he has won to Christ. Evangelistic pastors are very, very important to the world. But in the Bible, the role of the evangelist is key to turning the world upside down. Now, in England, the evangelical revival, and almost the same time, the Great Awakening in America, they had evangelists. George Whitfield, John Wesley. You know what? I dream about these guys when I read the history. Here was John Wesley. He was a slight man. That means he was skinny and short. And he would stand up with a very powerful voice and preach in a very compelling way the gospel of Jesus Christ. I read a Southern Baptist professor who said the greatest sermon ever preached other than the ones in the Bible, was John Wesley's sermon preached over and over again. He must be born again. After I read that, I went to a church in Illinois for meetings, went to their office. I'm still not very good at computers. I was really bad back then. And I went to the internet, their computer, and I found John Wesley's, You Must Be Born Again. I decided to print off a copy. So I pushed this button and that button, and I printed out 19 copies. <laughs> Plenty of scrap paper for a while, but I read it. When I read it, Brother Ingram, I said, if that was, I didn't say Cleveland, but I'm going to say Cleveland. If John Wesley were alive and stood up and preached that sermon in Cleveland, there would be so many people won to Christ. It is still as compelling and powerful. John Wesley's brother was an evangelist, too. He wrote, Hark the herald angel. Have you ever listened to that, Carol? It's full of the gospel. Born to give them second birth, he wrote. And can it be that I should gain an interest in the Savior's blood? Where did they sing those songs? Everywhere. There were open-air meetings attended by 10 or 20,000 people with Wesley, a slight man, or Whitfield, a round, eloquent man with a bounding voice preaching the gospel of Christ, and hundreds and thousands of people were coming to Christ, and the wicked, degenerate culture of England in the 1700s caused by the unbelief of the um, Enlightenment, that wicked country was week by week being transformed by people coming to Jesus Christ through the voices of evangelists. Yeah, always when we get it right, there are evangelists. In the sense of evangelists, they travel. <laughs> See, they don't live one place, and they primarily want to preach the gospel. John Rice said, every evangelist today must be a revivalist in order to have lost people to preach to. Because if you go to a Baptist church and you're gifted to preach the gospel, they're probably not going to bring you people to preach to. 
unless they get revived. John R. Rice said, preach revival. And you know what? It takes a week or so. See, well, we want to have two-day revival meetings. Ha, ha, ha. You think that we are going to be revived in two or three days? Come on. Our lukewarm, worldly hearts and minds will be set aflame in two or three days. I don't think so. They would preach for days to Christians. And then you know what happened? The Christians would get revived. Then they'd bring the lost. And their witness would be powerful in the lives of those they bring. And you know, that's what an evangelist was. He was a member of a church. I've had people say to me when I say that, you mean a local church? Well, yes. In my opinion, the church is local. Amen. That's right. The church of Jesus Christ is local. And a, an evangelist must be a bona fide member of a church subject to its do doctrines and disciplines. When I was a uh, pastor, I heard a recording of an evangelist who was really, really attracting a lot of attention. I said, I'm going to get him out to our church, Junietta. But you know what he did first? I checked with his local church. Now, that was a weird thing to do. But before I got a hold of him, I checked with his local church, found out he was disciplined. They had caught him in some wrong. Good thing I checked with his church, don't you think? Amen. So evangelists, however, although subject to the discipline and doctrines of a church, an evangelist is given freedom. See, the pastor at the church of Antioch, where Paul was the assistant pastor, was named Barnabas. And Paul was sent out, actually Paul and Barnabas, from their church, and they did evangelistic work around the world. But they didn't have to call home every week to get permission to do anything. They were given freedom. Amen. And they would come to church, and they would have public meetings. And that's how the churches started. It's amazing. It's amazing. They used evangelists. Now, guess who is the model evangelist in the New Testament? Paul is, of course, used as an example. And in the Greek language, he was an evangelist. So was Philip. But who is the model evangelist? He stood in the synagogue of Nazareth, Luke 4, 18. And he said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he hath anointed me to evangelize the poor, to heal the brokenhearted. And then he said, This day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. And it was Jesus Christ. Did you know Jesus wasn't a pastor? He is the chief shepherd, but he didn't gather a flock that he pastored. No, he was a traveling preacher. Way up in the north, he was a country preacher. Town to town, proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom. Now what would happen would be, an evangelist would come to town with a vision for everybody to hear the gospel, and they would hear the gospel, and then as we're gonna learn in a minute, they'd start a church, and they'd have a, an evangelistic pastor. Believe it or not, appointed by the evangelist. The first pastors were appointed by evangelists, and off they would go, and the cause of the gospel went forward. I'll say this one more thing for you to think a minute. <clears throat> These men were the big voice, the big voice of the gospel in the country or around the world. As a matter of fact, there are men who are gifted to appeal to the public mind where the average man says, I think he's right. There always have been men like that. Bob Jones started Bob Jones College and University. A while back, I heard some of his uh, sermons from area-wide campaigns. And I listened to one of them there, and it was about the rich fool, about the man who had laid up all these things, and uh, he was a farmer and had laid up all these things and then said, take your rest, soul. You've got plenty. You can retire now and relax. God came to him at night and said, Thou fool, this night thy soul is required of thee. Remember that story? Here's how Bob Jones handled it. He said, first of all, I really admire this man. He became rich farming. Now that takes something. Talk to them in a very practical way about that. And then I admire him too because he was smart enough to save. He took what he had 
produced and put it away for the future. He said, I think that's a very wise man, don't you? Then he ended up with this. He said, if you would use the same common sense that you use for the ordinary things of life about your soul, you would come to Christ and get saved tonight. Now I consider to think of a bunch of guys sitting there in overalls thinking that man's right. <laughs> and you know what? There have always been people gifted to do that. I've had people say to me, do you think there are people gifted to do that today? I said, yes, because that's God's plan. A big voice for the gospel, as well as local pastors taking care of the flocks. And uh, they will say, well, where are they? And I would say, I think I've met them at some of the Bible colleges. I'm not sure which ones they are, but if we would ever give them the freedom to exercise their gift, we would be a whole lot better off. Let me ask you a question. If in Ohio there were evangelists who had the public mind, they, people were drawn to them, they would get on radio or TV, or we would give them a public place where they could preach. People would gather, and they would walk out, and they would say, you know what, I'm not a Christian, but that guy makes sense. Can I ask you a question? If there was such a thing, let's say one or two or more of them in this area, so that the average person in Cleveland knew what the gospel was. I remember when I was witnessing as a college student in the 1960s, one guy I talked to about Christ said, that's what Billy Graham says. And you know what I said? I said, yes, that is. Now, Billy Graham started softening even more after that, but he used to preach the gospel. Now, let me, here's my question for you. If there was a big voice for the gospel in our area that made it so the average person on your street had at least heard it once, would that help or hurt us? It would be enormous. And you know, the great awakenings were all forwarded by evangelists and so was the first century Christianity that turned the world upside down. Number two, take a look at this. They spread the gospel, but look at how they did it. Here was the evangelist. Look at verse two. And Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them and three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the scriptures, opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead and that this Jesus, whom I preach unto you, is Christ. Look at verse 3. His message was that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead, and that this Jesus, whom I preach unto you, is Christ. What would you call that message? That Christ died, was buried, rose again the third day. We call that message the... Okay, now, how did he preach the gospel? Okay, watch. It was public at the synagogue. It was repeated three weeks in a row. The repeated public, look at the rest of it here. It says he reasoned with them. Some people think that an evangelist is not an evangelist unless he needs Ritalin. Screaming, yelling, cultural, hallelujah. I remember going someplace, hearing an evangelist, a Baptist evangelist, who got up there and uh, during the sermon, he had an NIV Bible he had just bought, I guess. Told us, here's the NIV Bible. Here's what to do with it. He threw it on the floor and he stomped on it. And you know what happened? We went wild with amens. Amen. What I was thinking when I was sitting there is, I'm glad I didn't bring my Catholic neighbor. I'm talking about reasonable evangelists. It was a public, repeated reasonable, scriptural, reasoned out of the scriptures. Do you know if you ever hear a man preach from a text in the Bible, and if you can't see what he is saying on the page of the Bible, if what I'm saying you can't see here, I tell you, it's worthless. Right. Right. Public, repeated, reasonable, scriptural, clear, opening, clear, He's up there preaching. Somebody you know is sitting there, and the light comes on. Oh. Oh. Opening and alleging. That means he's calling for a decision. It would be this kind of preaching. Public, repeated, reasonable, scriptural, clear and decisive preaching of the gospel. Over and over again. Have you ever had the idea 
that sometimes a lost person needs to hear the gospel more than once before he gets it. How about you? So here, public meetings. Evangelists over the years have put up tents. Then the Christian people, you know, brought their friends out to hear him. And the hand of God was on the man. And you know what? Soon the gospel was common knowledge. And then before long, people were getting saved. Over and over again. Repeated every night of the week. The gospel is being preached. Issues are being dealt with. Sin is being condemned. God is being glorified. The Bible is being preached over and over and over and over again. Like Burlington. Did you hear about Burlington? I'm not going to take the time to tell you about it, but I heard about it before it happened. Got on the phone and talked to certain people. I'm going to tell you, I'm so moved. And it's not about the evangelist. Do you know what we want? We want an evangelist who is the greatest man that has lived in 100 years. So we can all recommend the evangelist. We want him to be a Rip Snorton preacher. That evangelist was a North Carolina preacher. When I was in a teenager, I lived in North Carolina. And I'm going to tell you, I know how North Carolina preachers preach, and it's not like Ohio. See, it's not, here's a great, no, no, no. You know what it was about? It was about the people of God in Burlington humbling themselves like James 4. Brokenhearted, contrite, getting clean and giving their life to God. You know what events like that makes me think that God is trying to tell us, if you get off your high horse, I would do that with you too. And that is what he's saying. If we would humble ourselves, he'd do that with us too. But often it's an evangelist and this repeated type preaching where people finally start getting it. And that's what happened in the first century without a doubt, without a question. That was it. Number three, the next thing they did was form churches. You see that right there. And some of them believed, not everybody will believe, and consorted with Paul and Silas, and it tells you how many. They formed a church, okay? The evangelists would preach, a lot of people would get saved, and then they would form a church. Why would they form a church? To retrain them. You know what some people thought? If we got a certain Republican elected president, everything would change. But I'm going to tell you, people are messed up. People are messed up about the way they think. That doesn't come from an election. That doesn't come from a television channel. <laughs> Here's what it comes from. People won to Jesus Christ because you know the world doesn't need a new idea. The world needs deliverance. And the deliverer is Jesus Christ. And you know what they hear about him? And they're delivered. Then you gather them and you teach them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. You retrain them. Now, there are a lot of people who are involved in sexual immorality and don't know it's wrong. How many of you would say, yeah, I know that. I know there are people who are shacked up or doing some other kind of sexual thing. They have no clue it's wrong. Raise your hand. If you don't know that, I tell you, you don't get around very much. And they need to be retrained. I know of a church in an inner city established by a man who grew up in the neighborhood. He went down there and started a church in the neighborhood and won people to Christ, and he made rules like this. <laughs> if you're a member of our church, you have to marry her. Amen. Amen. You can't be a member unless you have a legitimate marriage. <laughs> yeah. Then he said, you have to get off welfare. He actually was warned by one of the older preachers in the neighborhood who said, you know what, this isn't going to work in this neighborhood. No, no, no. Uh, this isn't the kind of religion we follow. And the young man said, this is what Jesus taught us to do, and we're going to do it. Can I tell you, if this country is ever going to get straightened out, we're going to have to tell them about Jesus, bring it to Jesus, and then retrain them. Retrain them all over the world. The churches were turning pagans into Christians, not just in their profession of faith, but also in their way of life. See, that's it. That's why God is calling evangelists. God is calling church planning pastors to do the training and teaching. And then, don't you see the rest of it? They got in trouble. 
and they had an accusation. They said, they're meeting at Jason's house, and these that have turned the world upside down have come hither also. And then they said this, and they're doing things contrary to the decrees of Caesar, and they teach that there is another king, even Jesus. And you know what? Those people won to Christ were taught to march to the beat of a different drummer. Amen. The Sermon on the Mount, the book of John. March to the beat of a different drummer, following a different king. And my friends, that's what this world needs. They need to hear about Jesus Christ as Savior, but as King. Amen. And they need to be taught to subject their way of life and their way of thinking to him. That's what was happening in Thessalonica. Oh, man, that's what was happening there. And that's what needs to happen right here, right here. We need to go forward with the program in every way. And part of it is going to be somebody listening to this sermon deciding, I'm going to follow another king, even Jesus. A lot of the reason why this isn't happening is that people who come to church, young people growing up in Christian homes or Christian schools, that a lot of people who name the name of Christ and have their name in the book of life aren't really following Jesus as king. Yet they followed him as king and said, I forsake all. I deny myself and I'll follow you. I'll follow your lead. I'll follow your example. I'll follow your words. I'll follow you to the end of the earth. I'll take up my cross. I'll follow you to death. I'll tell you what. That's what revival is. The power of the Holy Ghost comes upon people willing to obey. But that starts with something as simple as this. They say there's another king. His name is Jesus, and you know him. And you know what? If you decided tonight, I'm going to follow Jesus as my king. And whatever he wants is what I'll do. I'll tell you. This week would be revival for you. and would be the beginning of something big for this dark world. They used an evangelist. They preached the gospel a certain reasonable way. They formed churches, and they followed another king. That's Jesus. Let's stand up. Can we just stand up? We're about done.